Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, pre recorded webinar for California Relief's Tree Recovery Grant Program, our request for proposals that are due June 6th of this year, 2021. Um, joining me today is um, my colleague Amelia Oliver with California Relief and the founder and president of Irving Ecos, Colleen Ravden. My name is Chuck Mills. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Grants Administration at California Relief. And over the next hour, we're gonna guide you through uh, multiple facets of the RFP or the request for proposals for our grant program. Um, at this time, uh, we hope to keep it to about an hour. Uh, this is not rehearsed. In fact, this is the first pre-recorded webinar ever for California Relief. So there are likely to be some hiccups along the way, but we hope you get a lot out of it. And we'll try to go at a reasonable pace that um, offers a lot of information as you prepare your application for submission before June 6th. Okay, so as I mentioned, the lineup today, um, we'll be talking about a variety of different issues regarding the RFP. Um, my colleague Amelia and I are uh, very closely connected to this program. Uh, we manage it together. We have several grants that we're managing right now. And then we do this in partnership with Co Colleen Rapton, who calculates the GHG reductions for all applicants and for all grantees. And she'll be talking more about um, strategies for uh, planting and success in this application as we move forward. What we'll be covering over the next hour or so, um, grant guidelines overview. Uh, these are available at our website at californiarelief.org. Uh, some focal points specific to this grant cycle. Each of our grant cycles has a different focal point. Um, so a few grant writing tips just to help with a successful application. Uh, Colleen will be talking about planning and designing your project, and then Amelia will be uh, helping you navigate the application. First, a few plugs for some things that are upcoming that we think will be of interest to folks attending uh, this webinar. The first is um, California, our California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, which runs the state's urban and community forestry program, received $10 million a couple weeks ago in an early action wildfire package through the state budget for fiscal year 2021. Those dollars will be rolling out in the next couple of weeks. As always, uh, applicants for the program include nonprofits. The award size is gonna contain um, a minimum of 150,000. We go up to uh, one and a half million dollars and uh, look for technical assistant workshops to be announced throughout the state soon. And uh, one thing that I also wanted to stress is that there are no restrictions on applying to both programs. So you can submit an RFP for our tree recovery grant program while also submitting your, an application for um, Cal Fire's program as well. Another grant program that's coming up that may be of interest is the uh, Cal EPA Environmental Justice Small Grants Program. Uh, urban forestry has been awarded funds in the past uh, through this program. Uh, recently, a couple years ago, they integrated climate change uh, proposals as a, a project theme for Environmental Justice Small Grants Program. So we do encourage some smaller nonprofits to look at this program. Awards up to $50,000. Um, and as you can see here, examples do include increasing green space and tree cover in urban centers. Uh, that deadline is a little bit past ours, June 30th of this year. We encourage you to apply and check it out. More information is available at the Cal EPA website. Okay, so each year when we do a request for proposals from our granting program, we try to focus on a variety of different things that we think are gonna appeal both to uh, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and also prospective grantees. In the past, we've focused on um, uh, job creation and workforce development, uh, maintenance of existing trees, uh, diversity and um, planting projects, including uh, community gardens. This year, uh, in recognition of the uh, challenges that 2020 brought in terms of uh, economic downturn, obviously pandemic, a variety of other social and economic factors that created hardships for community groups across the state, we really wanted to focus on trying to uh, rebuild capacity um, in areas where it's needed most. And so these grants are very much designed to try to take as much burden off the grantee as possible uh, through a variety of different mechanisms and also focus on um, projects that are supporting pro uh, disadvantaged communities and low-income communities 
Uh, as always, the projects need to contain a significant tree planting component, but um, our effort here is also to lift up communities that, that were economically adversely impacted last year. So more of an overview, as I said, emphasis placed on capacity rebuilding. Uh, some changes that we've done in the past, for those of you familiar with our program, uh, we're going to 80% of the grants going to be available for personnel. When we started this grant program a few years ago, it was at 50%. So this is a substantial increase over uh, past grants. Indirect costs, we recognize the need to have some funds available for expenses not directly related to uh, the administration of the grant. This has gone up to 12%. Uh, we've increased the maximum award. It used to be 75,000. Now it's up to 90,000, but still having a nice minimum there for um, small community groups that are looking for uh, more modest projects, a minimum of 10,000. Sliding scale match. First time we've ever done this and we have a slide uh, explicitly devoted to that that I'll get into a little bit more. Uh, something that I wanted to stress here and that I know um, Amelia may be talking about later on is uh, planting trees by April 30th. We hope to award grants by um, the first week in July. Such a give folks uh, two planting seasons, uh, well, both the fall and spring, to get their trees in the ground. The reason for this is that we want to give you ample opportunity to uh, maintain and observe those trees over the next um, couple of years before the grants end in uh, December 31st, 2023. So an opportunity to uh, maximize establishment through state funds. Looking at eligible projects, we really do encourage diversity. And um, one of the benefits of this program is that it does allow for opportunities to look at some uh, items that aren't typically funded through a lot of state grant programs. This includes uh, fruit trees, community gardens, bioswales, one of the challenges that um, some groups encounter in this project is that we are using funds from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And as a consequence, the projects do have to have a significant uh, GHG reduction component. However, that does not preclude these other projects that I just discussed. What we encourage folks to do is look at projects where they can have be multi-purposed, where you can plant some very large trees that are going to get some really good GHG benefits. Uh, these can be street trees, trees and parks. And then that may create opportunities within your application to also look at some of these other um, multi-benefit projects that fall within the realm of urban forestry, but may not have the GHG component, but certainly have a critical co-benefit such as a local food source. So um, again, consider a multi-pronged proposal that contains multiple project elements with tree planting and complementary components. As I mentioned, sliding scale match. This is the first time we're doing this. And what we wanted to do is try to provide an opportunity for smaller groups that may have difficulty um, raising match dollars or in-kind resources or even volunteers in light of the fact that we're still within a pandemic to create an opportunity for them to apply for funds and, and minimize the, the burden of match on them. So you can see that very small grants are gonna have a minimum match of 10%. And then we just go up from there to where the larger grants still have that required minimum match of 25%, which has been our standard for all of our grants in the past. But again, we wanna try something this year that will hopefully uh, maximize opportunity for smaller groups with more restrained budgets. And you can see here um, an example of what we're talking about for a mid-scale project in terms of a match requirement versus what uh, relief would support through an award. Meeting the match requirement, this is something that we strive to um, enforce with all of our prospective applicants and our grantees, is that we recognize the burden of coming up with uh, in-kind resources can be challenging, especially when you're coming off of an economic downturn, such as the case in 2020. We strongly encourage volunteers to be a major focal point of your application. Volunteers are valued at one of the highest rates in the nation, uh, over $31 in the state of California. Um, of course, volunteers are critical to creating stewards for the future in urban forestry, and they build a sense of ownership for the project. So if you look at the guidelines, which um, will be, I know Amelia will be going over the application and the, the guidelines that are attached to them, um, you'll see that we created an example where you could have a project 
that was um, built almost entirely on volunteers and uh, match trees and match equipment so that the budget itself could be focused almost entirely on personnel, education, and admin and indirect costs. So we encourage you to really look at opportunities and volunteers. We are the um, volunteer coordinator for the state of California and urban forestry. So um, we're always looking for great results in, in this area and, and hope you'll be able to incorporate this into your project. Finally, before I turn it over to my colleague, Colleen, I wanted to go over just some tips for um, making a strong application. Our applications are evaluated by a review committee consisting of uh, several groups or several entities, uh, including California Relief, but we also get feedback from in the environmental justice community and other natural resource entities. So it's a diverse combination of eyes looking at the applications. And here are some things that I picked up with last year's that may be helpful for you. Um, plan, plan for a, an application or plan for a, a project that's going to take a couple of years. Like I said, we want to be able to create opportunities for the uh, grantee to be able to maintain trees over an extended period during that critical establishment uh, period. Submitting your proposed planning list, the benefit of doing that early is that um, Colleen will has happily agreed to evaluate uh, your tree planting palette to see what kind of GHG reductions you're getting from it. Um, we offer some guidelines and suggestions on what you should be looking for in terms of GHG reductions per $10,000 in application requests. She'll be able to get back to you and let you know uh, whether or not the species selection and the locations are going to get um, big bangs for bucks or if there's maybe more work to be done there. So uh, that's a service that we provide to, to all applicants So take advantage of it. Um, getting community feedback. We've heard how important this is, especially in low income and underserved communities um, across California. Uh, some groups will host a charrette um, prior to submitting their application just to get a sense of what they're planning, if that's something that the community is looking for. Um, and it's also an opportunity for you to get uh, feedback on something that maybe you've overlooked that could be incorporated into your project. Reading the guidelines in the appendix, um, we have tried to really pare down um, our guidelines and our appendix to provide you just the most critical necessary information for pursuing uh, your application. Um, take a look at them. I, they're not very long. There's a lot of good information in there. We link to some critical places that could help you develop your application and get a better understanding of what we're looking for. Um, hot off the presses, literally posted to our website uh, last week, I believe, is uh, Trees for the 21st Century, a publication that we uh, did that was supported by CAL FIRE in a previous grant program that we closed out just yesterday. Um, this is going to provide a lot of information on opportunities to uh, plant right place, uh, right species. It was developed by California Relief with a significant input from Urban Ecos, and uh, it, we really think you'll enjoy it. Uh, take a glance at it. Um, again, long project. Uh, don't forget to, to put in costs for replacement trees and vegetation. This is not uncommon. Uh, most of the grants that we manage, there's some replacement trees that um, come into play over the grant period. If you have a budget for it, it's easier to uh, insert that later in the game as needed. Um, we've already talked about being creative and meeting your match requirement. We really want to see projects that are going to uh, allow for capacity rebuilding in communities that were, were hit hard, especially over 2020. So if you want to work with your local nursery or at local hardware store to um, see your match come in in the way of supplies and trees along with volunteers so that most of your grant could be for these other areas that are more difficult to find in, in match and sometimes through private foundation funding. We strongly encourage that. Um, being mindful of maximums and budget caps. Uh, Amelia's gonna talk a bit more about this. As I've said, we actually have a pretty strong um, maximums this year and, and pretty strong budget caps in terms of you know 80% for personnel, 12% for indirect. Um, we're really trying to focus this uh, to community benefit organizations that could use these funds to, to rebuild. Um, but we do have specific caps and maximums that you should keep in mind. A maximum of $90,000 per grant for the award. Um, be realistic about what you can accomplish. 
you know, we've we've fallen into the trap before of becoming overly ambitious in applications that we've submitted to state and federal governments, uh, only to recognize that maybe we've uh, overcommitted to what we can do. Uh, we've never had that uh, come in, come back and, and backfire on us, but um, you know, we're looking for competitive applications, but we also recognize their limitations to what can be accomplished with the funds that are available through this grant. And then finally, we're all here as a resource. Um, I've sent numerous applicants and grantees to Colleen before to get feedback on species selection and location. Uh, Amelia, my colleague, is a certified arborist. We're here to help you in any way we can. We've done a couple of workshops at the community level over the past month um, in the Central Valley in Southern California. And we continue to provide that technical assistance, not only during the application period, but throughout the um, granting period as well for those that are awarded funds. Hope this has been helpful to you. And at this time, I'm going to share my screen with Colleen Rafton at um, Urban Ecos and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. And thanks everybody for, uh, for being here to view our, 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 proposed, our presentation. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Thought I had this figured out. Okay, so what I'm here today to talk about is planning for a successful project. So um, both in the application process, what kind of a project is gonna be most likely to get funded? And then also on the ground. So once, you're, once you have your project planned, what, how can you go about making it thrive and the trees grow? And um, at the end, it has accomplished what you hoped it to accomplish. So, hang on. I'm, Chuck, it's doing things uh, by itself. Sorry, everybody. Remember how we said we hadn't, we, we did practice all this, but you know, these things, they have a mind of their own. All right, so as Chuck mentioned, these are projects are funded by the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which means that they need to have a substantial greenhouse gas benefit in order to qualify for the money. So the best way, so I wanted to start today talking to you about creating a successful project is going to be one that has a significant greenhouse gas benefit. The only quantifiable greenhouse gas benefits that we're allowed to count towards the project come from trees. And so I thought we could start by talking about how trees produce those greenhouse gas benefits as a way to guide you into making good choices. If you've done a grant proposal with us before, you've heard me talk about this. Um, but it never hurts to, to cover it again and, and really get a grasp on what's going on here. So the first way that trees reduce greenhouse gases is through sequestration. And basically trees are just pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. Through the magic of photosynthesis, they're turning it into tree parts, trunks, branches, leaves, flowers, roots. But of those components, the most important part really is the wood itself. So if you have a tree with a lot of wood in it, you have pulled a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. There are some other pieces to that equation, but really this volume of wood is the number one one. So in this case, bigger really is better. If you wanna plant fruit trees or small ornamental flowering trees, you're just not gonna get nearly the same bang for your buck that you would if you planted say a large native oak. You can just see by looking at it how much more wood there is in the tree on the bottom right. And in fact, it's going to take you more than 20 of these tiny trees to get the same greenhouse gas benefit of that one oak tree. So you can see from a project planning perspective, the problem is that those little trees on the left, when you first plant them, actually cost about the same amount as the, the tree that will eventually grow to be that big. So in order to get a cost effective program from a GHG benefit, you're, you're, it's going to be a challenge if what you want to plant is a lot of small trees. Um, so we'll talk more about how those things balance out in just a second. The second way that trees reduce greenhouse gases is if you plant a tree strategically to shade a building, it can significantly lower the temperature inside that building, which lowers your need for air conditioning, which reduces the need to create electricity at the power plant, which reduces the emissions of greenhouse gases at the power plant. Now that all sounds very circuitous and vague, but if you're in the very hottest parts of California, that benefit can be enormous. It can actually be equal to the benefit that you get from sequestration. Not to mention just that you're actually just making living conditions much more comfortable for the people that are inside the house. 
So with this regard, we usually say that you need to probably plant <coughs> twice as many trees that aren't shading buildings to get the same benefit from one large tree that is shading buildings. Now, as the science has progressed in this regard, it's gotten to be a little bit more nuanced. And so one thing I will say is, generally speaking from a shading perspective, trees planted on the west are the best because they're blocking that hot afternoon sun. The east side blocks the hot, theoretically the potentially hot morning sun. The south is a bit of a challenge in that the sun in the winter is coming mainly from the south. And so if we plant a tree on the south side of the building, we can actually be making it cooler inside in the winter, which might increase our need for heating. Um, this is going to be particularly a problem if you plant an evergreen tree to the south of your building. And if you are planting trees to the south of buildings in more moderate parts of California, then your benefit from reduced energy use, from reduced air conditioning use is smaller because you might not even have air conditioning and your cost in that, so, so the balance gets off a little bit there. So we can talk more once you have your project sort of, sort of laid out a little bit about whether there are ways we can maximize the energy conservation that comes from trees by shifting species and shifting trees. Um, I think this is kind of an exciting like frontier in, in environmental science. And so um, I'd like to see us be thinking a little bit more about how that works in the future. So generally speaking though, what I'm saying is let's move along the spectrum from these small um, isolated trees that aren't shading anything towards a vision of a neighborhood where we have big, large shade trees pulling a lot of greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and also making for a more comfortable atmosphere inside the buildings that we're living in. Chuck mentioned the trees for the 21st century and this graphic gives you some general ideas about how to maximize your sequestration power and your energy conservation. And we tried to keep things general because the rules can be different in different parts of California just to give you some ideas about what would work where you are. And again, feel free to come and talk to us about these things as the project develops. Um, generally speaking, we're asking each proposal to strive for an average greenhouse gas benefit per tree of about two and a half tons. Um, and that also we're asking people to strive for a greenhouse for a cost per ton of CO2 of about $100. So we would figure out both of those things. Um, once I've calculated for you your greenhouse gas benefits, we'll just take that number and divide it by the number of trees and see if we get something close to two and a half tons and we'll divide it into your project cost and see if we get something close to $100 per ton. So I'm gonna emphasize this again, please come to us early for planning advice if we can help. I have a background, a degree in landscape architecture that I rarely get to use, this is my chance. So please, uh, I'm happy to help you with that. Just, just a, an amalgamation of things that have happened in the past that I think we could help you with. So for instance, it's not really unusual for us to see a proposal of a, gigantic school lot like this, which has acres of asphalt. And people have said, we'd like money to plant two trees in the middle of the playground, two small trees in the middle of the playground, which are not, you know, they're gonna get run over by four square balls and children. They're gonna die from heat stroke and they're just gonna look really silly out there in that gigantic black field. So we've been able to say to people, hey, we can make this a little bit better if we just move them closer to the building. We can make it even better if we bump those trees up in size so that they actually have some stature there. And hey, even better would be if we could just plant a lot of them. We'll have a lot of benefit both from shade and from sequestration and the children will have a better place to um, be going to school. And so here's just a, a Photoshop, really fast Photoshop of what that original designs we've seen looks like. If you can, here's the trees go away, here are the trees appear. You can barely see them in this vast sea. Now I'll say that this is also not a, this is an attractive school. It was built in the 1920s, but modern schools are not so attractive and we might even be happy to hide them a bit. So maybe we move the trees back towards the door. We frame the door and, and, and help people know how to enter the building. Or we can even make a beautiful little urban forest for them that has a great both greenhouse gas benefit and a larger environmental benefit in terms of air quality improvement, shade, wildlife habitat, uh, stormwater infiltration management, and just a chance to really experience nature right there on the school grounds. So um, 
once you have your project in some kind of a state, like in a first draft, second draft, again, please send it to us as early as you can. And I will calculate for you the greenhouse gas benefits. If you've done a project with us before, we've made this even a little bit easier now. Um, so I'm asking for two things from you. One is this revised species list, which we just ask you to tell us what species you're planting and how many of them. And I used to ask you to tell me what they were gonna, where they were gonna be in relation to the buildings, but we found that that was just not really working at this stage of the project. So instead, we're hoping to guide people to two other components of the project that um, will, that we use to judge what it's likely success. So the easier one is the mature tree height. So I just spent a bunch of time talking about how bigger trees sequester more greenhouse gases. Here, if you can see at the bottom, I've explained for mature tree height, please just tell me if it's small, that is to say it's mature size is under 35 feet, medium, meaning it will grow to be 35 to 60 feet, or large trees over 60 feet. And we don't have a proportion of trees we're asking you to plant that fit into each category, but I think this can help call our attention to the fact that, you know, if you've got 100 small trees and five large trees, you're almost certainly not going to meet the target. So this is just to give us a sense of how those numbers are breaking down. And then in column C is the WUCOLS rating. And I can't unfortunately remember what WUCOLS stands for, but basically that's a state database that helps you figure out um, based on your location <laughs> and the species, what kind of water demands it's going to have. So, excuse me for one second. It will tell you very low, low, moderate, or high. Generally speaking, CAL FIRE is asking us to focus on trees that have very low or low water use levels. It looks like we have another drought on the horizon. Um, so even moderate trees with moderate water use are going to be a challenge to keep alive under those circumstances. And trees with high water use would only be suitable in places like uh, in wetland areas or along stream beds where there's a natural, nearly at least nearly permanent water source for them. The other thing I'm asking for, if at all possible, is a planting map. So where are those trees going to go? It doesn't have to be great. If you have a landscape architect's drawing, that's fabulous. If you don't and you're able to put together on the bottom right is just an aerial image from, uh, from Google Maps where somebody has drawn in where the trees are gonna go and told me which species is gonna go where, that's fine. Um, this gives me a chance to get a sense of what kind of energy benefits we might have, if any and also for us to be able to talk about whether we're maximizing those locations as much as we can. So in the end, I just wanna close with a little bit of a summary from that document that Chuck mentioned, which is our trees uh, planting for the 21st century and talk about the components of that that we're using to think about your project application and then also what will make your project successful. So guideline number one, please plant the biggest species possible if there aren't infrastructure concerns like power lines overhead, or it's going into a tiny spot in someone's front yard, um, we really wanna strive for the biggest species possible. Guideline number two, plant trees to shade buildings when possible, is again, I'm gonna get a little bit more nuanced about that. This is a great idea if you are in the hottest parts of California. If you're someplace where the temperature regularly gets over 100 degrees, you should be planting trees to shade buildings no matter what, because you're making people's lives just that much more comfortable and reducing their energy bills and reducing all of the environmental um, challenges that go along with using up energy. Also, you know, we tend to run out of energy in California relatively often. So the less we can use, the less likely we'll be to run out of it and have to have things like rolling brownouts. Guideline number three, uh, again, choose trees with low to moderate water needs, except in special circumstances. Again, with an emphasis more on the low end and fewer on the moderate end. One thing that we saw happen in the last drought was communities really insist on absolutely all water, excess water being shut off. So for instance, um, our, our partners at Tree Fresno have now, are now working to make sure that trees when they're irrigated are on its own special irrigation line so that then hopefully we'll be able to make the case, we'll shut off the water for the lawn, which will be, you know, if it dies, it dies and it grows back without much trouble and be allowed to keep watering the trees, which if they die, will take decades to bring back to their previous standards. So really thinking about where the trees are gonna go, are they gonna be able to be watered? 
Are they going to be able to be watered in the future if um, a lot of water restrictions are put into place? Uh, now is the time to think about that. And here is a little picture. We used to be able to grow redwood trees pretty much anywhere in California with a little bit of effort. Now Cal Fire is really asking us to limit their plantings to right along the coast, which there was their original, more of their native range, because we just aren't finding the ability to get enough water to them to keep them happy. And then they die. Guideline number four, select trees that have shown resiliency to pests and diseases. This is harder to talk about in a general sense because those pests and diseases can be kind of regional. Um, when we see your species list, we'll help you to figure out if you've got anything that's a challenge. Um, so there are so many challenges now. The best solution probably is guideline number five, which is diversify tree selection wherever possible. So we're going to ask you in your project to have as diverse a species list as possible. Um, and I'll, this is the reason why. So this is a picture of Dutch elm disease, which came to the United States in the 1920s, but really swept across the country, um, sort of state by state. <coughs> and campuses and cities went from looking like the top picture to looking like the bottom picture in just a couple of years. One was because our elm trees were not resistant to this particular pest, but also that if you look at that top picture, that that cathedral effect of the trees planting happened because it's just one species planted all the whole way down there. They're touching each other. They can share their diseases. And um, it was just like a conduit for a pest to move through there. So we're asking you diversify your project, not just your own species list, but also think about it within the larger context of where your trees are going. So if your city happens to have a very heavy percentage of say, um, London plane trees, maybe you don't want to plant a single one of those into your project. Or if your tree is very, if your city is very heavy in ash trees, maybe that's a thing also to avoid in your project, just because you don't want to contribute at all to increasing that, uh, to reducing that diversity. And guideline number six, avoid trees with a moderate or high invasive potential in your region. And in our guidelines for the 21st century, we give you some sources actually to address all, to find information about all of these things. There aren't actually too many species yet, uh, too many trees yet um, with invasive potential in California. But what we want to avoid are things like this beauty, the tree of heaven. Once a species, you find it growing in a spot like this out of the crack of a building and happily reaching already knee height um, that tree is going to grow everywhere. And it's going to take over things as this tree has taken over many of many parts of America and Europe. And you can even see it's made a baby already down there in the bottom right corner. So uh, we're going to try to avoid contributing to problems like this by uh, wise species choices again. So finally, please choose wisely and be realistic as Chuck mentioned. Um, any changes to the project, including to the species will have to be approved by us and by CAL FIRE and your original GHG target will have to be met. So um, for instance, I've seen people tell me that they're gonna plant a hundred silver maples. And I go back and say, I know this is your application, but I know this is not going to happen. No one is gonna let you plant a hundred of these massive trees in the places you want to. And it's gonna be impossible for you to meet your GHG target. So let's get a realistic plan now before you've signed a contract saying you're gonna do something and then you find that you can't do it. We'd much rather have a realistic project than a really ambitious one that just can't, that can't be achieved. So those are my guidelines for today. And um, here's my email address again. Please feel free to reach out anytime in the project process, except for the two days before it's due because that's a really busy time. And uh, I'm happy to offer any advice. And now uh, followed by my colleague, Amelia, I will Amelia, are you there? All right, well, here is our- I, I'm here, I'm, this oh. is Amelia. I'm trying to put my video back on, but for some reason <laughs> I can't. Well, I was just gonna say, this is our technical challenge number two. Okay. Um, um, Chuck, can you send me a request to update my video and maybe I can do it then? I mean, to turn on my video.
I can. Um, okay. Awesome. And then you can maybe spotlight me too, because oh, for some reason, my whole that whole part of my screen is done. And now let me get in here. Okay. I have All right, control. Yours. Hello, I am Amelia. And I'm, um, I get to do grant reviews and then, um, you know, help people out with the technical aspects using my experience in grant. Um, I don't know why that just happened. Hold on. It's going ahead on its own. There we go. So I, what I wanted to talk to you here about was about just this bulky grant application that you've got to turn in and and you know what you what you need to have together by that June 6th date it seems it seems hard and easy at the same time um there's a little checklist that's in the grant um application packet and I'm using that kind of as my basis and Colleen just went over the when I have checked off the GHG um spreadsheet that she uses at your well your list your trees and and as we said that's something you can supply to us a little bit early if needed so that we could um, let you guide you through improvements or help you make your your application more competitive so we're just going to go through this a little bit um, and one thing i just wanted to say is you know you have an idea hopefully you're applying for this grant because you have an idea of how trees can can have a positive impact your community and and in the process of writing this application you should be able to somehow through your words and pictures, let us see that project as well. That's one thing when we're reviewing them, we wanna we want to see what you're seeing. So that that helps. And when there's pieces missing, it gets hard to do that. Um, you know, the, the easiest piece on the in the whole application is the is the cover. And um, please, please, please give us the correct mailing address. And um, yeah, when we send that, we, we will use that address to when we when we draft out a contract, if we are um, actually going to contract with you um, and we'd like to have that, make sure we have the correct phone number for the person who's completing this or who you want to be the person who answer, answers questions. And if you have, if you are um, going to be using a fiscal sponsor for this, if you're not a incorporated 501c3 or you're just really new into this and you don't have the capacity, you can use a fiscal sponsor. And we do want their name and their mailing address. That is who the payment checks will, will, will go to. And one other thing is this is a fillable PDF, um, the application that you have, do test it. I, we've had numerous times on the the day before it's due and and people are having trouble filling out the pdf so do test it and and download it and make sure you can save the parts um, and you'll be able to send it to us do that the first thing you know one day and and we'll try to if you're having issues with that contact us early so that we can figure out what the issue is or maybe there's someone else with your organization who has a different version um a, a more updated computer or, or something that could could help you with it the um you know, the first questions in this application are your general ones about your organization and what this project is. And please keep this project based. Um, we want to know, we want to know about this project, but we want to know why your organization can do this project and um, how they're going to do it and why they're going to do it. So we want to make sure that that um, we can understand why urban forestry and why a, why this uh, urban green grant is something that you want to do. So through these through these various questions, that's what we're asking you. The um, the questions on these two pages again, we're finding out more about your project itself. And I start two of them. The the one about the economic ben recovery benefits is is Chuck talked about that a little bit. We'd like to know how this project is going to uplift your organization. Uh, what, what about what is it about um, this grant that will help you rebuild the capacity of your organization? And then um, for question seven, um, community engagement. You know, who are you working with? What partners are you working with? Are they people you haven't worked with before? Um, the more people that you're bringing into this project, the more sustainable and doable the project feels and the longer the more um, impact it'll have on your community okay so i have this planting details and specifications and we also have we asked for site photos and a map but i put these two things side by side 
because we're not there. We don't. We may not know your neighborhood. We may not know even know the city that you live in. We've. Um, I've been been able to do site visits some places I've never been before through these grant programs. So we want to know about this place you're planting. What can you tell us about it? Um, so I. I used on the right, I used Google Earth to give a visual on, um, this is a project that's happening up in Olivehurst. And so we can see where the trees are going. And I can, and that picture really tells you there's not a lot of trees there. There's not irrigation in this place. There's buildings, you know, there's a lot of information you can get from that picture. So between your pictures and, and your map and your, um, you know, description of location, we should, we should get an idea. Also your, um, maintenance plan who's going to be doing the maintenance after the project is over you know we don't want it we we you know we really don't like projects where that's an unknown we want to know that it's that someone if it's at a school is the school maintenance crew going to take over if it's at a park is the city or county going to take over is there or is there a nonprofit that's going to take on or are you going to take be continuing to do the care so so let us know about that and one question we always ask is how are the trees going to get water so uh, making sure that you, you cover irrigation, whether it's going to be hand watering or whether there's a, a system in, that's going to be in place um, installed by you in this project or that's already there, make sure you identify that. Okay, so we've got our project um, application done our, um, and we have our maps and photos ready. The next thing we're going to dive into is the, is the timeline. Um, I started the two important dates here, which is the trees are supposed to be in by the end of, end of April. So let's, let's make sure you show them all being put in before the end of April next year. Um, also use this time, spread it out, do maintenance and replacement trees throughout the, the remainder. So we wanna see a project that's going to, to use the funds over the course of the time and not just spend it all at the time of the trees that are, the trees are being installed. Um, and also like if you're going to, if hand watering is going to be involved, make sure you do that. If you're going to be using educational components of your projects, such as pruning clinics or things like that on your, as part of this, make sure you put them on your timeline as well. Uh, okay, so we have these two important documents, which are really small, but are super important. And this is permission to plant and your professional sign off. But, um, you know, the, we need to know at the time that we're reviewing those applications, whether you're going to be able to plant the trees there or not. We really can't approve a project that we don't know the trees can be planted there. So um, city, school, whatever it is, there are occasions if you're doing a pr planting project that involves maybe front yard trees or um, where you're, you're not sure you're going to do a tree giveaway. You're not, you're not exactly sure if, um, you know, those are the exact locations that we will waive this um, and wait until the project is, is uh, approved before you go to those residences to make sure you can put trees in their yard. But that, that you know, usually you're doing them in a public or um, public space. The professional sign off, this is a difficult one if you are in an area where there's not many per, um, urban forest professionals that you may know or have access to, but it is an important part because as, as an organization that we haven't worked with, we really don't know your, the level of your competence in urban forestry. And so having a, just a, 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 a person who has the training sign on, it just really helps us show that the project is, um, is a good one. So we've got, we've got, oh, we got the big pieces done and we're going to move into the really fun one, which is the budget. So there's a lot of stuff on here on this particular budget page. And I didn't want to spend forever because you may have specific questions on your, on your budget when it comes. But one thing I do want you to know is that this budget, this budget page should be a standalone document. Make sure that your name is on it. And make sure that any that, that there's enough detail in here that we can we understand um, what you're doing and how much it's going to cost. We should be able to add up the number of trees. So you know it should say how many trees you're getting by the species and what size those trees are, so we can get an idea of what you're spending or what's being donated as far as trees. Um, and under your personnel, that should include all your costs that involve involve people, whether they're stipends, whether they're contractors, whether they're doing education, whatever it is they're doing, they should be all captured in the personnel part at the top. 
Um, we have, um, you know, the cap of 80%. So make sure you don't, you don't exceed uh, your cap on that. And then um, down um, on the indirect is a, is at the bottom, it's, it's going to be 12, no more than 12% of what you ask, um, you cannot use indirect as match. So that your indir indirect is, is only on your, in your um, direct expense column. And as a shift to that volunteer, volunteer time always is on the donation, donation side. And if you are getting in-kind um, or professional expertise donated to your um, project, you don't need to put that under the volunteer time. You could put that at the top under matches and the personnel time. So at the rate that they would charge you if, um, if you were going to pay them directly. Um, I think the only other real like cap on this is the sign signage is, is $500. I think the rest of these are pretty easy. And one thing that Chuck you know, did mention with an 80% you know, cap in the uh, personnel, it gives you a lot of room to, be, to have a, a you know, spend a lot of this, this particular grant on personnel. So you can have, you know, trees donated, you could have supplies donated, all those things could be donated or reduced. If you get discounts on them, those would be considered match as well. You can split the cost. You can, you know, it's, it's a really uh, great grant in that you don't see many programs that we've had in the past that, that allowed for that heavy personnel um, cost of, so we can get some projects completed. Um, so the next part of it is the explanation of expenses. So you've done your budget, but there's some things that you just really needed to explain a little bit more. That's what you should be writing down in the explan in this ex uh, explanation of expenses. So, you know, in this picture, they bought brooms, you know, maybe brooms are on your thing and you want to make sure you're, you're you know, not going to do some house cleaning with that. You could, you could call that out. Or if you have a big piece of equipment you're going to be buying, um, you'll want to explain that here. Um, so just use the opportunity here to, to, to let us know more so we don't have to call you and ask. And then where your match is coming from, that second one, um, is, is, it, is it professional in kind? Is it all volunteer? Are you getting um, the trees donated? All those things. So any big items or unusual items in your match are all going to be um, completed on this particular page of the, of the application. And it's the proof of project location. So um, we want to know where the trees are going, because as you know, we have some, some targets and goals of, of um, reaching communities that maybe don't have canopy currently. Um, so the, the uh, AB 1550 maps, if you go to, there's a website there, you can also just Google and um, Cal Enviro screen 3.0, and you'll find this map as well. And you can just put in an address and it will show you the address where you want to plant. You can back it up and see a whole community. Although when you get closer in, you'll, you want to zoom in on where you're planting because you'll see those slight variations. And the real focus of this grant is on the areas that are blue, striped, or pink and pink in color. So you know, they don't all have to be in those areas, but those are, are um, where we're really trying to get a lot of these trees. So we only have our attachments left. And the last piece we need is your letter of determination. We do not need your articles of incorporation, which many people send us. We just need your letter of determination if you're a nonprofit. And if you're not, we'll need, we'll need to have a um, acknowledgement letter from your, from your fiscal sponsor. So it's just a real short, um, letter with them recognizing their role in this grant project. And if they are a non-governmental uh, agency, we will also need to have their um, letter of determination. If it's going to be with a city or some or school, then we don't need that. But if it's going to be with another nonprofit, we will need that bit of information. So we got it all here. Um, I wanted to take off my um, I want to take off my spotlight, if anyone can do that, and you can see us all again, perhaps. And just really wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to learn a little bit about this application. And um, let's maybe take off screen share so we can.
see everybody here. All right, you're all on it now. You guys have anything to say at the end? We hope this is uh, really valuable for you. Like I said, this is our first pre-recorded webinar. Um, and uh, you know, offer us some feedback after you get done looking at it and say, what could we have done better? What were some pieces missing that you would like to see included? Um, and uh, you know, as we move forward, we'll try to incorporate those uh, if we go down this path in the future. But please do use the Solace resource. We're here for you. This is, um, this is the favorite part of my job and um, we wanna see you succeed and, and continue to green our golden state. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to look at this and um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.